the hour. I've known for several years, Brother Steve Yates. He's one of those preachers who is making tents for a living, and that seems to be more and more the case with preachers who are determined not to be moved to the left or the right of gospel truth. He works full-time as director of operations for Care South Home Care Professionals. He directs home health agencies in Murfreesboro, Nashville, Winchester, and Mount Eagle, Tennessee. He is also happy to help serve the Murfreesboro Church of Christ in teaching and preaching. Brother Gary Grisell works along with him in that. Steve holds a master's degree from Middle Tennessee State University and a bachelor's degree from Harlem University. He and his wife, Brenda, will soon be celebrating their 16th anniversary. You know, you don't look that old. And they, and they have three daughters. Steve's hobbies are running. It's always good for preaching to have that hobby. <laughs> Basketball, bowling, and watching. I can't say this down here. I didn't say it. Watching the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> he also holds an SSC license, a disc jockey. Can you preach too? He slices your dices. Well, I know something about his life, his holiness, his godliness, his faithfulness to the Lord, and we certainly wish him well. He's going to be speaking to us tonight on something that should be of interest to all of us regarding history. And that is having to do with the history of, shall we call them, unity movements in the Church of Christ. Steve, come speak to us, please. We're glad to have you with us. It is my pleasure to be with you. I do very much appreciate the hospitality shown to me by the brothers and sisters here. Certainly appreciate the oversight and strong leadership by brothers Roth and Cohn and Stevens and much love and respect for David Brown, one of my heroes in the faith. I appreciate him very much. And thanks, big thanks to Steve Johnson. Really appreciate Steve for allowing me to stay with him. He picked me up at the airport yesterday, allowed me to stay with him, and it was my pleasure and privilege to get to meet him and his, and his daughters and really appreciate your efforts. It's been four years since I was here, and during the interim there was a, a rumor circulating around Middle Tennessee where I live and, and preach that Steve Yates had gone to Texas. Of course, that wasn't nearly as far south as some folks had hoped I would go, uh, based upon some of the climate of what was going on in the, my stand for the truth in that area. But this is my first venture back into Texas since then. I'm glad to be with you and do have an appreciation and love for this congregation for many years for your stand for the truth. Is there hope for a family reunion of two church fellowships who have served God apart since 1906? That was a question raised at the North American Christian Convention in 2003 in Indianapolis when Rick Atchley stood before 8,500 folks and brought them to their feet in cheers and applause, applause as he said, quote, I believe with all my heart that in my lifetime we can have a family reunion. His closing remarks that day were this, quote, for a hundred years we have served God apart. Only God knows what we can do in the next 100 years serving him together. And so it goes with the unity movements, the unity meetings, which as Brother Brown pointed out this morning, nothing more than unionizing and agreeing to disagree on matters of eternal destiny. That's what it is, and we need to call it what it is. If you look at the demographics of the churches of Christ in this country, there are over 13,000 congregations with 1.2 million members. You look at the independent Christian churches, there's about 5,500 congregations with also about 1.2 million members. And you look at the Christian church, uh, parenthetically, and really more prominent than ever, the Disciples of Christ, they, ha they boast a membership of about 850,000 and some 3,300 or so uh, congregations. Well, if you do the math there, not Ma and Pa Kettle math, but if you, do, if you do the math there, then you find out that 
the body of Christ could nearly triple in size if those who have adhered to the baggage of their ancestors and have now throughout the years obeyed that which is an error, the body of Christ could triple in size if we had true unity on scriptural matters, right? But if you take that a step further, well, all of those who are mired in denominational error, the body of Christ could be infinitely bigger than it is if folks would set aside their preconceived notions, their emotionalism, their ancestral baggage, and simply adhere to the pattern of the New Testament church. Follow Jesus, who said for himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of God in Corinth, and he said in 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 10, he said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There was to be no division among the body. But as we've learned throughout the years, there has to be a dividing line that faithful brethren draw in order to pursue and preserve the sanctity of the truth for which Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, so saith the Savior. Paul, by inspiration, lets us know in Philippians 3, verse number 16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Now, what's wrong with that? It is what it is. Walk by the same rule, mind the same thing. We can do it. But these unity movements, these unity meetings that have occurred by those who have erred from the faith that has spawned off prayer sessions and, and meetings and forums, they're not the least bit interested from what I've seen in true scriptural unity, but what they're doing is the spiritual equivalent of inviting the foxes into the hen houses to plan for and pray for the welfare of the chickens. That's not going to go very well, is it? We're all about unity. Aren't we experiencing this, uh, this uh, unity today? Aren't you going to experience this true unity in Jesus Christ this week? We're all about that if we dial into the same standard. That's all we ask, nothing more and nothing less. True unity is not what the apostates have in mind. Not Philippians 3.16 unity. Not John 17, 20 and 21 unity. Not uh, Ephesians 4, verse number 3 unity. Not 1 Thessalonians 2, verse number 13 unity. That's not what they have in mind. What they have in mind is the religious umbrella that we are about to open is large enough for everybody. Come on in. And it doesn't matter what says the scripture. When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, that's what he did. And, and those words echo through 20 centuries since the time that he spoke them, and to you and me and those of like precious faith around this state and around the country and around the world, they offer us comfort and encouragement and strength and hope in their beautiful words. But to folks who are steeped in a denominational worldview, who have either ignored, rejected, or twisted the words of Jesus, they mean nothing at all. They cannot comprehend religion except it be through the compartmentalization of denominational thinking. That's how they see it. But we see that it is one. I remember uh, this... Uh, this month, uh, for, for many reasons, uh, well, this is a leap year. February 29th is coming up this Friday. It was February 29th, 1992, that I obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was scriptures like Matthew 16, 18, like John 17, the, the entire chapter, but certainly verses 20 and 21 where Jesus prayed for unity. It was scriptures like Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 that shook me to my core because I had ignored them for many, many years. But I finally learned by opening my heart to the scriptures that Jesus built one church. It is his. And it's a beautiful thing. But so few people embrace the oneness of Jesus' church. That's why the New Testament is, is full of warnings about what to do and what not to do because we have a pattern of what to do and what not to do. 
but it's centuries uh, elapsed from the first century. And further and further digressions were being found in regard to people stepping away from the pattern which Jesus had set forth. We, we find in the early centuries following the establishment of the church that babies were being baptized. We find that an early form of dispensational premillennialism was being taught. We find that elders were overstepping their boundaries and, and city bishops were becoming uh, bishops over multiple congregations. And we find that uh, precursors to Calvinism, such as original sin and non-biblical predestination, all these things were being taught prior to the 6th century A.D. And then from that point for about the next 1,000 years of world history, the Roman Catholic machine of religious corruption controlled everything. But in the 16th century, we saw and learned from history that efforts began to push back against the Roman Catholic sacerdotal system and corruption. And this protest and this attempt to reform the apostatized church became known as the Protestant Reformation. But the problem with the reformers was just that. They were reforming error, not restoring truth. That was the problem. They didn't go far enough. The efforts of reformers like Luther and Fingley and Calvin, they took some steps, but due to their own outright failure to fully submit to the pattern of the New Testament, they didn't go far enough. Luther held to the doctrine of faith only. Fingley refused to believe that immersion was an essentiality. Calvin, well, we know the tenets that, that bear his name, including babies being born totally depraved and once saved, always saved. We know these things, so it's no wonder why their followers fell into that trap of human compromise and things just, what, really what was a fractured religious world became shattered after that. It didn't get better, it got worse. Because they didn't go far enough. They did not return to that form of doctrine about which the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans and he said, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. They didn't go that far. Not back to the pattern, not back to the form. Even though they did take a measurable step away from Roman Catholicism, they didn't go far enough. And hundreds of other apostate religious bodies sprang forth. And here we are. Jimmy Eaton noted in his booklet entitled An Overview of Church History that there were several major changes that stand out regarding religious bodies that have drifted away from the New Testament pattern. He pointed out four things. Number one, the organization of the church was changed, leading to church councils, creeds, headquarters, things like that. Number two, the clergy versus laity concept overtook the universal priesthood of the body of Christ. Number three, the pattern of worship in the New Testament was outright rejected. And number four, the plan of salvation was changed, where immersion was optional, if you're sprinkled or poured, that's good enough, or the sinner's prayer, things like that. Those four major changes. But despite the, the apostasy that was present and that proliferated down through the, through the ages, despite that apostasy, all around the world on the continents, uh, the, the populated continents of this world, there were folks who continued to plant the unadulterated seed, which is the Word of God, that seed that when you plant it can only produce the Church of Jesus Christ. That continued. Thus, in, in every era since the first century church was established, since the church was established, there have been restorers in every era. Those who seek to follow the pattern, to submit to Jesus Christ, to do it unashamedly, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I submit to you folks, until the second coming of Jesus Christ, there is going to continue to be a need for restorers to plant faithful congregations wherever they are. We live, folks, in an era of revisiting restoration. And anybody who doesn't subscribe to that is out of touch with reality. We are in that era. We have brethren here in our presence who have been part of efforts like that. Well, why are you doing that? There's 15 congregations in town. Why are you having to, to, to re-restore, as it were? 
because when folks get away from following the pattern, the faith will say, no more. We will follow Jesus. And we should never make any apologies for that. But what we have is a religious world that cannot see things except it be through a denominational worldview. But you know that attitude is in the church. Have you ever heard any of your brothers and sisters in referring to other religious bodies? They'll be talking about the Lord's church, and they'll say, well, other denominations do this. But they'll be referring to the body of Christ. I fear they can't frame their mouth to pronounce it right. They're trying to say shibboleth, but it's coming out sibboleth because they are who they are. Are you with me? It's coming out here wrong because they don't have it right here. They can't see it except it be in compartmentalized denominational terms. So when you read about restorers who abandon uh, the Methodist Church or the Baptist Church or the Presbyterian Church or you fill in the blank, any number of man-made churches, when you read about folks who abandoned that and who in their boldness said no creed but the Bible, we, we stand in appreciation and recognition for those folks. And we should be no different. Those who try to dismiss the body of Christ is nothing more than a movement, Stone Campbell movement, or the title that the denominational world likes to throw around is Campbellites. They can't think outside of the terms of denominational worldview. That's why they say what they say. Satan doesn't grow weary in his efforts to undermine the body of Christ, does he? And unfortunately, he has many willing participants because many folks for, for many years have accepted a dumbed-down version of Christianity. They have refused to study for themselves. They have refused to see the dangerous situation they have placed themselves in as per the days of Hosea when my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Folks can only be led astray when they allow themselves to. Folks can only be led astray when they are ignorant of what God's Word says. So when you look at unity efforts and you look at unity movements or meetings or whatever term applies forums, and you consider the disciples of Christ and the independent Christian churches and the true body of Christ, you understand with review and research that the disciples of Christ were, you talk about uh, liberal before it was cool. I heard that line last night. They were liberal before it was cool. Way before. They were starting to accept the liberal thought and the textual higher criticism of the scriptures back in the 19th century. Well, the, the group that splintered from that that became the independent Christian churches who are considered conservative, but they use the instrument. What's so conservative about erring from the pattern of the New Testament? What's so conservative about that? But that's the label that stuck. And then uh, we have those who remain true to the fundamental principles of the New Testament, the true body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. And I submit to you that the invitation is always open for folks of any religious flavor whatsoever who want to truly set aside their, their, their notions, their, their preconceived ideas, their, uh, their, the doctrine of their ancestors. If they want to set that aside and have true unity meetings, I'll be part of that effort. If they want to simply follow the New Testament pattern, wouldn't you be interested in meeting with folks who are interested in that? But we find that unity movements that were spawned in the 20th century and have continued into the 21st century, those generated by the independent Christian churches and the liberal members of the body of Christ, they're not the least bit interested in unity the way Jesus sees it. They're not. 
one of their champions of unity, the independent Christian churches, says, quote, we realize that unity can exist in agreements on essentials while allowing diversity on other matters. Now, I wouldn't have a problem with that statement if it were true, but let me translate. <laughs> in other words, matter, matters of doctrine doesn't matter. You, you think baptism is essential? Good for you. I happen to not think it's essential, therefore doesn't matter what we think. That's what he's saying. It's not a matter of option whether or not mechanical instruments of music should be used in worship. It's a matter of faith. It's not a matter of option whether women should be allowed to be elders and preachers and, and, and take uh, leadership roles in a corporate setting of worship. That's not a matter of option. But for those who err from the truth, it is. It's not a matter of option whether or not we're going to respect the boundaries of New Testament fellowship as per 2 John 9 through 11. That's not a matter of option for New Testament Christians, but if you have an ecumenical mindset, it's just fine. So I submit to you that whether a person is a member of the independent Christian churches, the disciples of Christ, whether they're a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Roman Catholic, a Muslim, a Buddhist, whatever their false belief system is, if they're willing to set that aside and truly study the pattern, then they first must acknowledge what Jesus said, and that is all authority is given unto him in heaven and in earth. Accept that. And then accept his plan of salvation and, and don't tweak it. How about that? And then... And then Follow his pattern for New Testament worship. Now that sounds so easy in theory, but it's very difficult apparently in application. Folks who want to wear the motto, we're Christians only, but we're not the only Christians. They're drinking the Kool-Aid of unity and diversity. They're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when you obey Jesus, you will be Christians only. And only those who have done that are Christians. We've got to get folks back to the basics. The itching ears of those who refuse to accept the exclusivity of upon this rock I will build my church, that same mindset that causes them to reject the oneness of the church also causes them to reject the non-negotiable terms of the plan of salvation in the first place. And if you miss the church and you miss the plan of salvation, then surprise, surprise, you've missed the pattern for worship. You track a timeline in this country of folks drifting away from the faith, the faith that those who were true restorers fought hard for. You find that instrumental music was introduced in 1859 in Midway, Kentucky by L.L. L. Pinkerton. You find that 10 years after that, Pinkerton denied the plenary inspiration of the scriptures. You find that 20 more years later, R.C. Cave denied the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. You find that by 1908, H.L. Willer, a founder of the Disciples Divinity House, denied the miracles of Jesus. Folks, when you're on the slippery slope, it's hard to stop. There they go. And though the independent Christian church is identified again as a conservative group, what's so conservative about violating the pattern of worship by adding mechanical instruments? What's so conservative about overstepping the boundaries which Jesus has set forth in 2 John 9 through 11? There's nothing conservative about that. The disciples of Christ have long been involved in open membership. Doesn't matter what flavor you come from, come on in. Pinkerton started that in the 1860s. Open membership. By the time you get to 1968 and the Disciples of Christ were a full-blown denomination, they actually just voted it in at that time. They had been one all along. They finally just realized it, I guess, and decided to go ahead and let the other shoe drop. They are now members, the Disciples of Christ are now members, members of the Council of the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, and have discussed the merger with the United Church of Christ. Their calling card, the Disciples of Christ, has always been ecumenicity. That umbrella will cover us all. 
come on in. They started that in 1902 with their general convention in Omaha. Listen to this language. It was resolved by the attendees at the Disciples General Convention in Omaha in 1902 that they do hereby express our cordial approval of the effort to bring the churches of this country into closer cooperation and to give truer expression to the degree of unity which already exists. Did you get that? To bring the churches of this country. What churches? Churches. Which ones? Doesn't matter. Come on in. That's their definition of unity. My friends, that's not unity at all. The disciples of Christ have seen their ecumenical fantasies all come true. You visit their website at www.disciples.org and you'll see ecumenicity in full bloom. You'll see an earthly headquarters in Indianapolis. You'll find a female general minister and president, Sharon E. Watkins. You will find that uh, on their website a link entitled Ecumenical Links, on which you'll find links to every other uh, denominational website that you can comprehend. You'll find regional ministers employed by the disciples, which is really an offshoot of a sacerdotal system of the Roman Catholic Church. And you'll find, uh, among many other things, the celebration of Christmas as a religious holiday, and obviously women in leadership roles. And the, and the beat goes on. Why? Because they fully embrace the ecumenical movement. They have 12 marks of identity that are listed on their website. I'm just going to give you a few uh, of note. Uh, because for sake of time. Uh, one of their uh, marks of identity is this, quote, we practice the baptism of believers, stressing that the way of Christ is costly while also recognizing the baptism performed in other churches. You've been sprinkled? You've been poured on? Come on in. Let me tell you something, folks. I was reared in the Baptist church. If the Lord's church had accepted my baptis baptism, I would not be standing before you today because I would not be a member of the blood-bought body of Christ. Another mark of identity. Quote, we give thanks that each local congregation where Christ is present through faith is truly the church, affirming as well that God's church and God's mission stretch from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. We give thanks that each local congregation of what? Doesn't matter. Come on in. The water's fine. One more mark of identity. Quote, we anticipate God's coming reign, seeking to serve the one whose loving dominion has no end. Now, I don't know what they mean when they write that, but being reared as a in a premillennial home, I think that's what they mean. Does that sound about right? We anticipate. We're looking forward to God's coming reign. My friends, Jesus is king of kings right now. He's ruling and reigning right now. That sounds like dispensational premillennialism to me. So if a full-blown ecumenical movement and effort was what Garrison and Pinkerton and the other architects of the disciples of Christ were hoping for, then I would say they have arrived at an unqualified success, wouldn't you? Now, while the Disciples of Christ will fellowship anyone and, and everyone as the true ecumenical organization that they are, and I keep using that word, and I do know what it means, <laughs> it just means everybody's okay. That's where they're at. But aren't some of our brethren inching closer and closer to that? Brethren who, who just, just within the last few years, you would never have dreamed that. But it's that ecumenical mindset that is taking root. Now, the independent Christian church and some leaders among liberal churches of Christ have been engaged in, in multiple efforts for about 70 years to try to heal our brotherhood, their terminology. In the 1930s, Claude Witte of the Church of Christ and James Murch of the Christian churches spearheaded a nationwide unity movement. Now, after six meetings, H. Leo Bowles was invited, and here's what he had to say at, the, at one of the meetings. Number one, this is what Bowles said, brethren, lay aside the denominational paraphernalia, destroy all denominational machinery and apparatus, 
and condemn the denominational spirit among you and come back to the New Testament and take up the plea of the pioneers for the unity on the New Testament and there will be unity between the Christian church and the churches of Christ on this point. Number two, Bowles said, you know where you left the churches of Christ, hence you know where to find them. Come back and unity is the inevitable result. Number three, Brother Bowles said, the churches of Christ, so long as they are loyal to the New Testament, cannot compromise on this or any other point so clearly taught in the New Testament. Amen. <laughs> That's it. It's like years ago when, when a reporter asked Ronald Reagan, why did you leave the Democratic Party? And he said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. That's about right. And that's how it, that's how it goes. If folks have left the body of Christ, they need to come back to the standard. But the Apostle John wrote of some that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. But they went out. They, they might be made manifest, but they were not of us. But his Brother Bowles' statements are, are, are dead on, still accurate. 1950s and 1960s, another search for unity was launched by Ernest Beam and Carl Ketcherside. And Ketcherside and his sidekick, Leroy Garrett, established a working relationship with the Christian churches, the independent Christian churches, and pursued it to their end. Now, in uh, 2007, this past September, 4 through 6, in Joplin, Missouri, there was held the 25th annual Restoration Forum of the longest-running unity meeting between the independent Christian churches and churches of Christ. About 1,100 people from 30 states and the nation of Canada attended. 21 speakers were on the panel. Let me know if you recognize any of these names. Rubel Shelley, Rick Atchley, Victor Knowles, Royce Money, Jeff Walling, Sue Ketcherside Burton. Anybody sound familiar to you? 531 attendees at this meeting last September agreed to sign what they called a pact for peace based upon Jesus' prayer in John 17. My friends, they can't handle the truth of what John 17 says. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth, to which the unity and diversity crowd scoffed as Pontius Pilate scoffed and said, What is truth? It's relative. They can't handle what Jesus said when he said they, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. They can't handle that. They don't want any part of that. Not true unity. Or else they would rally around the pattern of the New Testament and not scoff at those of us who choose to follow that pattern. Several years ago in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where I lived, there was a self-appointed ambassador. No kidding, that's what his business card says. I have it in my wallet if you care to see it after the fact. He referred to himself as an ambassador, and he listed his uh, organization as the Independent Christian Churches slash Churches of Christ. That's what his business card says. And he was making the rounds to all of the Churches of Christ, non-instrumental as the Christian Church defines it, and he said, had a motto on his, on his business card that says, Seeking the Healing of Our Brotherhood. Now, I agree that healing the brotherhood is a noble effort, don't you? There's a lot of healing that needs to go on right now. But nothing's changed with the fact that the pattern's the same. If we all dial into the same pattern, we'll, we'll be healed. <laughs> How about that? Don't even need to call Benny Hinn. We're healed. <laughs> Follow the pattern. He came up to me uh, after the service where he attended, where I preached at the time, and he gives me his card and starts talking about his effort. And I told him, I said, the healing can start when those who refuse to submit to the New Testament pattern start submitting to the New Testament pattern. That's what I told him. He said, well, if you think the division is over instrumental music, you're, it's way more complicated than that. Now, on that point, I don't necessarily disagree. But you know what? A lot of times in the church, we're very good at identifying the symptoms but we're not so good at tracing the symptom to the problem. If somebody uses instrumental music in worship, that's not their problem. If somebody tells you baptism is not essential for salvation, that's not their problem. Their problem is either a militant distaste for or ignorance of Bible authority. That's their problem.
Because if you understand Bible authority, you're good on what it teaches. You got no issue with baptism. You have no issue with mechanical instruments and music. It's a Bible authority matter. Now, uh, the Murfreesboro Church of Christ, where Gary Grizel and I uh, worship and labor together, uh, the ambassador has visited us since that congregation was planted in 2004. Still on his mission, apparently, to heal the brotherhood but apparently, as of yet, unwilling to do what is necessary to heal it, and that is submit to Bible authority. But on his initial tour through Murfreesboro back in 2004, he had some takers among the churches of Christ. And they met, and I understand that they prayed for unity. Again, no problem at all meeting with the representatives of the independent Christian churches or any other denominational body, if they're truly interested in submitting to the pattern and learning about Bible authority, we'll meet with them. We'll embrace that as we study the Word of God. But I tell you what, we're not going to have man-made union where the parties agree to disagree on matters that determine your soul's destiny. Can't do it. Can't try them to foot the blood of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Throughout the centuries, men and women with honest and good hearts have, have sought the New Testament pattern out. They have submitted to it. They have planted the Lord's church. They have found those of like precious faith or those of like mind who have obeyed the gospel and, and, and partnered with that effort. And in every century... Folks like that have worshipped in spirit and in truth. Several years ago in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where I live, my family and about 25 other brethren of like precious faith saw fit to plant a new congregation in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in a city where there were multiple congregations that bear the name of Christ. Now, none of us in this effort claim to have omniscience and know the situation with every single congregation in that area. But I submit to you that there was enough concrete and prima facie evidence to, that we had observed over the years to know that an effort to adhere to first century Christianity in the 21st century was a noble effort, and that's what we embarked and did. So the Murfreesboro Church of Christ was planted in December of 2004. And I'll give you one guess as to who our major philosophical persecutors and ad hominem attackers are. Y'all wouldn't know anything about that, would you? We haven't been persecuted by the religious world at large, but our names are smeared by brethren. But you know what, folks? When faithful Christians grow weary of the majority of, br of brethren and congregations who refused to follow the pattern for New Testament discipline. In fact, I had been in men's meetings at congregations in Middle Tennessee where they voted church discipline right out of the Bible democratically. When that happens, it's time to restore the Lord's church. When folks don't understand the boundaries of 2 John 9 through 11, and they'll fellowship anybody and everybody that rolls through town, it is time to restore the Lord's church. When you have those who are allowed to lead in worship, who are known to be, a corrupting influence in the church based upon their immorality and in their community and in their uh, various uh, stances on, uh, on matters of morality, when they are allowed to lead in worship and nothing is done to change that, it's time to restore the Lord's church. When local elderships are fraught with compromising brethren whose cowardice or lack of knowledge has turned loose the wolves on the flock, it's time for the remnant to restore the Lord's church. When the church has lost its distinctive nature in a particular area and is blended into the religious landscape, it is time to restore the Lord's church. And religious organizations like the Disciples of Christ and the Independent Christian Church who want to embrace every flavor of mainstream denominationalism and negotiate matters of faith as if they were a business deal, we can't unify with those folks unless they are willing to submit to Bible authority. The purity of the Lord's church demands we submit to Bible authority, that we engage in worship and fellowship and evangelistic efforts and benevolence, 
that follow the New Testament pattern. Anything less is not enough. Anything more is too much. And may we always give God the glory and echo the inspired words of the Apostle Paul, who said, the churches of Christ salute you. Thank you.